Well, 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 uh, Amirado, he's always spitting some it. positivity, some bars, yeah, some people would say. It was a very beautiful song, let's not forget that his song, Kwe Kwana, the original, is now nominated in the most popular song of the year and the best highlight song of the year category in the Telesol Garden Music Awards, uh, the 25th edition. So congratulations to you, Amirado. All right, so it is Good Living segment time. Please get ready to learn a lot. So I said earlier that this whole month is Autism Awareness Month, and so we are pushing the awareness for autism. And we started off greatly at the beginning of the month. Last week, Tuesday, um, we had a speech therapist here who taught us uh, certain mediums or certain ways that we could adopt or as a parent or a guardian who has a child living with autism, certain mediums that you could adopt to communicate certain things to your child. And one thing that I took home with me in relation to last week's edition was the fact that you need to be super patient. If you aren't patient, I don't know, or you might feel exhausted, or you might feel tired, or you might even end up wanting to give up. But never give up on your child. And kakakaka, you be drawing. That's the reason that we have something like this right here on Prime Morning for you to learn a lot from. And today's conversation, we are continuing. We are still harnessing us to push in the awareness of autism. My name is Asia Dua Akomia, and uh, my guest is seated and ready for the conversation. And so please, like I said earlier, get ready to learn a lot. Today, we are going to talk about the roles of occupational therapists the roles of occupational therapists. Now, who is an occupational therapist? Uh, how well do they contribute to a child living with autism? So get ready, like I said, to learn. I have seated with me this morning, Isaac Ewa Sian, who is an occupational therapist. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Very well, thank you. Yourself? I'm doing great. Uh, off air, I was asking you about the whole comparison and the differentiation of, because when I read a little bit about occupational therapists, it's like, yeah. ah, you all deal with communication, you all deal with uh, talking language and all that. So, okay, <laughs> what then is the difference? Please okay. help us really understand. All right, so I, that, that's because for autism there are some areas that are affected okay so it's a new developmental condition okay. that affects the child's development so we have the communication aspect we have social interaction and then we have the behavior wise okay yeah so that's how come we have communication running through the therapies right. yeah but okay. when we talk about occupational therapy we are looking at a healthcare professional mm -hmm. who is helping his or her client to be able to participate and then perform their daily life activities. Okay, so we are looking at things that make meaning to you. A lot of people confuse it. Are you going to give me a job? Are you going to help me find meaningful work to do? That's not all that we do. So we are looking at areas that make meaning to you. So right from waking up from bed till you come back to sleep. So like in the morning, you have a routine, brush your teeth, you yeah. take a shower, yeah. you prepare a cup of tea, you dress up, you drive yourself or you join a public transport to work. These are all activities you do. They occupy you. So th those, these things are occupation. Okay. So they occupy your time and they make meaning to you. Okay. So that's what the occupational therapist looks at. Mm. So we have some areas. So we are looking at the basic activities of daily living. Th these are self-care. So under that, we can have feeding, dressing, okay. bathing, toileting and toilet hygiene, brushing your teeth, personal grooming. And it happens that as an individual, growing up, you can be affected. And then your participation or your performance in these activities can be affected. And so the occupational therapist then assesses you, identifies the strengths you have, identifies the challenge or the skills you do not have at the moment in your life, and then we work at achieving these skills so you are independent at an optimum level. Okay, so basically, from what you're saying, you, when it comes to a child living with autism, yeah. you help them be independent at some point. Yes, please. You help develop them and grow them to be independent. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Yes. So now let's break it down to the specific roles oh, yeah. that you play. Okay. So 
We're looking at a child living with autism. Mm. This child is a part of a family. Mm -hmm. This child is a part of a society. Yes. When we talk about the society, we are looking at a school. We are looking at social gatherings. Yes. We are looking at church. Okay. We are looking at other engagements within the society. And it happens that because of the autism, this child's brain and how they process things around them, it's different from the other children we would call their typical development, okay? And so, as an occupational therapist, you are identifying the sensory behaviors that is affecting this child's participation. Mm -hmm. You're also identifying delays when it comes to some milestones. Okay. So, fine motor, these are activities we do with our hands. So, like handwriting, mm -hmm. stirring, mm -hmm. a cup of tea, mm -hmm. okay? And then we are looking at also some gross motor skills. It has to do with walking, has to do with sitting still. Okay, these skills can be affected in a child living with autism. autism. Okay. And then there are social interaction. That's a very big one. So it has to do with playing with their peers, playing with family, understanding that okay, so I'm home. This is mommy. This is daddy. This is my little brother. Okay. Being able to live with them and then. Going out there, being able to appreciate that, okay, so in the community there are other people yeah. I can associate with. And so I don't have to just clinch or just be in my corner. Actually, actually, from, from uh, the, uh, the series that we've started yeah. this month, um, one thing that I've actually noticed or I, I heard from our guests is that uh, sometimes, most of the times, children living with autism uh, tend to cling onto one particular family member a lot than the other. So if it's the mother always wanting to be, un, you know, in the arms yeah. of the mother, yeah. no, every other person, we oh, a stranger, cry, <laughs> man, not him and all that. Yeah. So, yeah. And sometimes I wonder how, if um, there are other family members, especially dads, yeah. yeah, I wonder how you can try and bring them in or help the child really appreciate that it's not all just about your mother. Exactly. You've got your dad too, you've got your siblings too and all that. Yeah. Yeah. But I also want us to come to the role that the these individuals also play in making sure that the child can get close to them. You get what I'm trying yeah. to say? Yeah, because sometimes it's not just about the child trying to reposition exactly. exactly. their brains. Yes. Yeah. So I use the term society. Yes. Or a community because right. this child falls within a family. Yes. Falls within school. Falls within a church. Yes. Falls within parties. Yes. And so the child should be able to live as independent. Mm -hmm. Should be able to process things mm -hmm. just like mm -hmm. in the society. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you are trying. You are you are helping the child. So this is it. It could be a sensory behavior, a sensory issue. And so the way the child perceives touch, okay. the way the child perceives proprioceptive inputs, so like they're in our joints, there are these sensors that help us to tell, okay, this is my knee, this is okay. my ankle, okay. joint, okay. and all that okay. is. They can either be under processing, and so they do not feel it, or they can be on the hyper side. For you and I, we would say we are on, we're able to manage balance. that. Yes, so yeah. balance it so well that even if there's a tag behind me, initially when I put on my singlet, I put on my shirt, I feel, oh, this thing is uncomfortable. But after off. a while, <laughs> you can just adjust to it. Yeah. But a child who has a sensory processing issue and is on the hyper side, realize that the child will not feel very comfortable. Right. And that's going to affect their attention. That's going to affect their participation in activities because everything is focused on the on tag. That. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if the child doesn't like touch and everyone in the society, oh, hi, how are you wanting to touch you? They can be very defensive. And that's what leads to the meltdowns. And so they are screaming and they, they are crying and everybody's asking, why is your child doing this? And so in the society, it feels like they cannot fit within the society. But the occupational mm -hmm. therapist is helping the child to understand that, okay, so let me help desensitize your, 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 your touch sensitivity. Let me help you to appreciate that, okay, this touch is not going to harm you. 
It's rather a friendly one. Okay. So that when you go to the society, when you go, you meet up with other people, you are not just going to cry, you're not going to scream, and everybody feels like, no, you, you, you don't fit in here. Example, you are in this busy streets of Accra with the cars honking, everybody shouting, mm. the hawkers and all mm. that. And because of the sensory issue, this child is just looking around, just, yeah. Yeah. Oh, what's happening? Yeah. But an intervention, just like an earplug, can help reduce all the noise. Thankfully, for these advancements, we have like airports that have noise cancellation. Mm -hmm. And so you can be in a very busy, mm -hmm. noisy environment, and then everything just shuts down, mm -hmm. and you are listening to your music. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so this child fits in so well, and is able to carry out the activities. Okay. Yes. And at, what, at what age um, is appropriate for a child living with autism um, should it, you know, encounter an occupational therapist? Okay. That's a very good question. Currently, we are pushing for early intervention. Okay. And so, <clears throat> usually, this is what happens. Parents identify that my child is not communicating just as I want him or her to do. And so they bring to see the doctor, or some just go to see the speech therapist. And then, from the assessment, the professional can pick up a few things mm -hmm. and start querying. Could it be that this child may be on the spectrum? But then, as occupational therapists, as health professionals, we are saying that bring in the child as early as possible. Okay. It doesn't matter if the child is just six months. Bring in the child. Because we have to um, keep data of the child's development. Right. And so if we are tracking these, we are able to identify, okay, this child may be showing some differences in their development. And so let's start therapy. Mm -hmm. And this really helps with the outcome. Okay. So how can you, as an occupational therapist, help a child living with autism? Okay. So like I mentioned earlier, we are looking at daily life activities. Yes. So to be more practical, let's take potty training. Mm -hmm. It can be delayed in a child living mm -hmm. with autism. Mm -hmm because they are unable to tell, okay, well, this, this edge I'm feeling, what does it mean? Be it wee wee poo poo. Yeah. Okay, sitting on the potty, I, I, it feels very uncomfortable. And so why do I have to sit? Why do I have to sit for so long to get something out of me? But then the occupational therapist comes in, okay, let's put in a few texture to the toilet seat to make it comfortable for the child to sit. Okay, whilst you are seated, don't, why don't we get you some Legos to be fixing, to engage you? And whilst you are doing that, you are free to push out everything that has to come. Okay. That's an intervention an occupational therapist does. Okay. But let's look at it. If the child does not have the gross motor skills, and so sitting, the child is mm -hmm. floppy. It's not all the case you're going to have a child with autism be floppy. Or the child does not have the fine motor skills, and so cannot pull down their shorts. If the child even feels the edge and gets to the potty, pulling down the shorts becomes a challenge. Yeah. So the occupational therapist has to train the fine motor skills. And so this child gets there, is able to open the yeah. zip, yeah. able to take off the belt, yeah. and then pu pull down their shorts. Okay. okay. And this also follows a sequence. And so where the child does not have that processing skill, the occupational therapist is breaking down the task. So we look at task analysis. Okay, what do you need to be able to potty independently? fine motor skills, communication skills, you need your gross motor skills. And so we break all these tasks down and then we train the children in them so they are able to perform the activities. With a child who is used to, let's say, um, bathing, for instance, uh, okay, you bath the child every time, then one day you just leave him or her to bath himself, but it ends up bathing a particular spot. Yeah. You know, like, continuously and all that. How can you as an occupational therapist um, help? Okay, thank you. So we are looking at awareness. It's possible the child just likes the input from that particular spot. This may be a sensory issue. Oh. That has to be looked at. Oh. And so how can we bring that same sensation to the other parts of the body? And so the child is aware, okay, after scrubbing here, let me also go to this part of my body. Right. Okay. So we are going to desensitize that very spot that is demanding for all the attention and then make it 
balance for every part of the body so the child is able to perform their bathing activity. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Last week, a question that I wanted to ask our guest was a, um, um, a child that oftentimes throws tan tantrums. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what, what can you do to help? Okay, so for tantrums, they are, we will tag them as behavior issues. Okay. okay. So, what is causing the tantrum? Example, a child is playing with his or her favorite toy. Oh. And then mommy comes in, it's time for feeding. You have to so it eat. It takes away the toy. It takes away the toy. Yeah. And this child goes into a defensive mood. No prior notice. <laughs> <coughs> you just come in and you take my favorite toy. How can you do that? Even for you, how would you feel? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We are seated and the lights just go off. Come on. Ami uh -huh. <laughs> And so these children understanding, okay. they, 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 they have, they, they differently understand situations. Mm. And so instead of just going to take away the toy, why don't you start preparing the child? And so from the time you start making your supper, breakfast, you try to introduce the child. Okay, so we're going to eat breakfast in, let's say, 50 minutes. And so you make sure the child sees the ingredients, sees that the you're, items. You're about to you make bake, the about breakfast. About to make it. Okay. okay. And so even as the child is playing, the child has a recorder somewhere. Okay. There is something going on in the background, and once you present it to the child, you try to take the toy slowly instead of just come and then you just snatch it. Right. Okay. And sometimes children who have Poor communication skills. I don't like to use those terms because it looks discriminating, but let's say poor communication skills. You can't really place your hand on what is causing the tantrum. Yeah. They can just wake up and they are crying. They're just hitting themselves on the floor. So what, what could be the problem? So the official therapist can actually just screen the child's routine. It's possible you miss the child's routine. So today, instead of brushing before bathing, you bath before brushing, and that caused the tantrum. Oh, okay, so when they get used to a particular routine, you can't just miss it, miss a step? Yes. Or... Not all the time. Not all the time? Yes. Okay. And so tantrums is a very big, and so we have to identify what are causing these tantrums, and then put in support structures to help the child. Wow. An occupational therapist, do you do anything emotional for the children? Yes, we do. You work on that as well. Yeah. So last week I told, um, I guess, that I actually have a relative, um, a distant cousin, who, um, yeah, he lives with autism. He has autism, but he's grown now. He's about 30 years. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. But, yeah, very beautiful. But here's the thing. Uh, emotionally... Communicating is a problem. Yeah. So it's like he still can't identify that this is a sibling and this is not a sibling. Okay. Because there was a point where he told a sibling, a, a distant cousin, that I like you. I want you to be my girlfriend. You get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. And like, if you do not know his situation, you could get angry. If you do not understand to some extent what it is that could be the problem, you, you would get mad at, ah, now, pa, you know, like that kind of thing. Yeah. So with their emotions, what exactly do you do to help them? Okay, so there's a typical example. This child growing up cannot tell the difference between siblings and non-siblings. Yes. Okay, and you want to help the child to understand, okay, apart from your brother and sister. You can have another brother and sister who is from your aunt, so a cousin. Uh, yeah. So helping the children to understand that not everybody you meet, random person who you haven't interacted with um, is not related to you. Mm -hmm. Even for us growing up, mm -hmm. realize that until you are taken to soci uh, some social events, mm -hmm. you may not be able to tell, okay, this particular lady is my yeah. cousin, is my yeah, auntie. Yeah, you yeah. wouldn't know until you are told. And okay. so we, we try to introduce these systems to the children, okay? Try to help them to understand that, okay. So in the family setting, we have father, mother, we can have grandparents, we can have siblings, we can have distant or external families. And these people make up the external families. And by teaching them, they, they tend to understand, okay, so a cousin is actually 
an uncle's son or daughter, if the mind picks up and is able to process that, mm -hmm. then this person is able to differentiate. So let's say in the process of you doing that, should you be introducing them to these relatives? Would that not be too uh, clumped up in their, in their heads or too clumsy in their heads? Yes, so you are introducing a concept. Okay. So helping them to understand family systems. Okay. So if this person understands who a cousin is, who an auntie is, who, is a, who an uncle is, when you introduce yourself as, oh, I'm your uncle, this child just defines, okay, an uncle is this, 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 mm -hmm. and then is able to map it up mm -hmm. and then appreciate who you are and how I am related to you and how you are related to me. Because sometimes I think about it and I'm like, this should be quite difficult because um, like um, this distant relative of mine, he's really a, an age where, I don't know my circumstances, I'm kind of also a girl. Mm. You, you get what I'm trying mm. to say? But he's unable to because of the communication and yeah. then all that because yeah. uh, of the situation. And so I wonder what exactly can be done to help him out. Yeah. You, you get me? Yeah. And sometimes I feel like, okay, at age 30, could it be too late? That's one thing. I, I, I feel we shouldn't give up. There's, there's, there's no giving up. Okay. And as you introduce, patience is very necessary in caring mm. for people who live with autism. Mm. And so we should never give up. Mm. You never know when. Because, okay, for speech development, there's actually a paper that suggests that children will develop language. But as to whether they will develop speech, it's uncertain. And so a child can be non-verbal, not using words, yeah. for close to like 18 years of their life. And then from 19, this child is communicating so fluently. So what could have happened those 18 years? Yeah. So why would you want to give up at age 30? So don't you give up. To continue. Continue. Yeah. There is hope. There's hope. Let's talk about highly, highly, highly effective occupational therapies yeah. that you, you can go through. All right. So. Let's look at education. Currently, we have a number of our children in schools. We are looking at more inclusive environments. Mm -hmm. and so you are not just going to leave them with special schools. Okay? There, there are criteria we have to look at before deciding, okay, this child should fit in a special school. This child should go to an inclusive environment. So in school, there are some skills you need. Okay. You need your visual attention. So being able to fix your eye on what is happening in front of the class, be it from the teacher. You need your cognitive processing. So understanding that this is the shape of an apple, understanding processes, okay? And then we go to skills like handwriting, because it's very necessary. In our yeah. part of the world, handwriting is very necessary. And so as an occupational therapist, who is working in the school setting, mm -hmm. you are putting in structures to help this child to develop the grip, to be able to hold the pencil, and making sure that holding the pencil is comfortable for the child, mm -hmm. to enable the child to write. Some children do not enjoy writing. Yeah. Because they are so used to fast moving cartoons, <laughs> everything is just moving in fast motion, yeah. and then you want to break it down, and okay, let's write a whole paragraph, come on. And so you put in structures, you are putting in visuals, you are, put, you are simulating it, mm -hmm. okay? You are providing the sensory needs that is lacking at that point to enable this child to feel very comfortable to hold a pencil, okay. to hold a pen, mm -hmm. to hold a crayon, and to perform their writing needs. Okay. Yeah. So in my reading on occupational therapy, I chanced on a sensory diet. Yeah. Can you please harness on that for me? All right. What so sensory diets, as the name suggests, is a diet. <laughs> so it's, it's a number of sensory inputs you are, you are given to the child. Okay. And so it, start, it can be colors. It can be textures. So we have this feels rough, okay? Uh -huh. And it can be smooth. So you are introducing this child to all these different textures, these different sensory uh, inputs okay. to help the child to adjust when the child comes across any at any, any point okay. in time. Okay. And it's calming to this child. Oh. So well, you, we'll come to the yeah. practicality of that aspect. And so, uh, viewers, Isaac is still in the building and we are still talking on the roles of occupational 
therapist. And so far, we've learned a lot about the role of occupational therapists. And I hope that you are learning as well. The conversation still continues. Uh, we are opening the phone lines for you at home to call in and ask any questions at all that you would love to ask Isaac. Anything that you would love to know about autism, uh, what it is that you might be struggling or uh, trying to understand when it comes to uh, your child who has autism or a relative who has autism. So like I said, Isaac is here. He will answer it all for you. The phone lines are open. The number uh, will be on your screen shortly uh, for you to call and let's get very interactive. And uh, you can send in your messages as well. But we are opening the phone lines, so please do call in. Now let's come to the practicalities of it. Okay. Yeah. So let's take the sensory diet. You take a child to the pool. Mm-hmm. You want your child to swim. Mm. But before you get there, there's this loud speaker playing music to entertain the others. Yes. But this child cannot really adjust in very loud or noisy environments. Yes. So what are you putting to help this child to fit in this noisy environment? You get earplugs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's the first thing that you can do. There's, it's something you can do. I'm not okay. saying it works for all, all the children. Okay. But okay. like a baseline. Mm-hmm. You can also start by introducing this child to different noise. So you can play ringtone, you can have the fire truck, you can have the ambulance for the child to differentiate. Okay, so it can be very high, it can be very low. And once the child gets to this environment, they understand, okay, we are in a noisy environment. Mm, mm. So let me adjust to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we get to the pool. This child may not really like water. And you want the child to enter into that big pool. At least we can start small. So from home, you get a tap, fill it mm -hmm. to a certain level, and get this child to put their feet in there, to touch it, to understand, okay, we can actually sit in this tub. Okay. So you are beginning to introduce swimming to this child, but it's gradual, okay? You can even put in the child's favorite toys to pick. And as the child is doing that, the child is interacting with the water and the brain processes it and understands, okay, this is how it feels to have your hand in water. It's fine. Let me get to it. The other side, too, sensations can affect feeding as well. And so if you have chips, the child feels like, no, this thing is too crunchy. I don't like it mm -hmm. with all the noises oh, making. Oh, yeah. The child feels this thing is too... Maybe the thick. chewing. Yeah. yeah. And so... You want to introduce this to the child first by working on the oromoto skills. Okay. Okay. So you want to, uh, you first have to assess does the child have the necessary motor skills to chew? If that is out of your way, how how is the child perceiving the chewing process? So sensation. And if you're able to point out all the skills that are lacking, and then you introduce the child to it. Gentle massages help. Okay. Mm. Chewing on toys. Mm. can be oh, a start. okay, okay. Chewing on toys. Yeah. Okay. So we have chewy toys that our children use. Okay. And then there's another one, a, a Z-Vibe. So it has vibration attached to it. Or even a vibrating toothbrush, okay, to help massage even the jaw. Even me, uh, see, <coughs> that vibration to it's so unco super uncomfortable for me. Yeah. So I never turn on the vibration. Okay. Why? Why? Do I, why? <laughs> I don't get it. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it, it can be fun for a child living oh, with autism. Oh, okay. Autism. Okay. And that okay. can really make the child enjoy brushing. Really? Yeah. Oh. Because it's providing the input they like. Right. Okay. It's like, ah, oh, something's shaking my shaking door. Shaking my door, and shaking my just, gum. Yeah. <laughs> And so they okay. feel like, okay, I like this thing. Mm -hmm. And they're able to carry out the brushing activity. To you, it's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And turning it off is an intervention. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because it makes you feel comfortable yeah. to do your brushing. Yeah. Yes. Incredible. Okay, so uh, we, can, can we please have the sensory diet uh, back on the plan, the lifestyle? Can we have it back on the screen? I want Isaac to take, okay, so sensory diet. All right. So Isaac... Uh, can you go through this and help us really understand? Okay, so we have here mm -hmm. like a, a routine the okay. child has to follow. Right. So early morning you wake up, mm -hmm. deep pressure hugs and snuggles. Uh -huh. So like I mentioned earlier, we have some proprioceptive receptors in our joints uh -huh. that 
can be either under stimulated and so this child does not really feel like walking child feels like okay let me just sit the whole day oh okay and so deep hugs we have the weighted compression vest which provides this input to the child and it wakes them up ah okay okay yeah. and then we have breakfast crunchy cereal mm -hmm. so it's possible you are now introducing the child to the cereal or this child enjoys it and so you give to the child and the child is fine to go. Mm -hmm. Get ready, so dry brushing protocol. Mm -hmm. So it could be for the mouth, it could be for the hair, it could be f even during bathing. Okay. So you wet a towel, you squeeze, make sure it's very somehow not dry, too not too wet. wet okay? yeah. And you apply on the skin of the child. Okay. To make the child feel very comfortable. comfortable. Okay, so school. There's a weighted vest, like I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, to help with sitting to help with attention, to calm them down. Because it's possible the child is in class and just thinking about what's happening outside. Their attention is not fixed on what what's happening, happening in class. class okay? yeah. So the weighted compression vest helps to address some of these issues. All right. Okay. Sensory seats. Child doesn't feel comfortable sitting on just the chair. And so just having this, then you put it on because it's very soft and comfortable, it helps it just improves the child's mood, mm -hmm. and the child is able to sit for quite some time. Yeah. And then you have to put in rest breaks. Okay. Because they need it. Okay. Everybody needs it. Yes. You can't sit for like five hours yeah. doing one thing and yeah. then. Yeah. yeah. So exercise ball time, just to engage their muscles, just to get them active. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you have a play time. So a crash pad, trampoline, jumping, yeah. swing. So when they swing, their vestibular system, their balance is also engaged. This helps with keeping calm as well. And then now we go to bedtime. Bedtime. So you want to play some calm music with the, in the background. Some children struggle to sleep. Okay. okay. Even for adults, they struggle to sleep. Having a weighted blanket can improve the child's sleep. Turning off the lights, let's say by 7 p.m. you start turning off the lights, mm -hmm. just to put the child in the mood, to prepare the child for sleeping. Mm. And so all activities are just gradually reducing around that time. And then the child feels like, okay, it's like a lazy time. Can we start closing our eyes? These help. Okay, so the sensory diet, so what does it aim to address or help okay so it's helping with keeping the child calm okay it's helping with the child being able to understand that okay within the day I'm going to do this and so it's getting the child to be expectant of something mm -hmm. to be able to carry out the activities mm. so it serves like a reward for the child and this helps them in their participation during activities for a parent who feels or thinks that, oh, the conversation that we're having and with everything that you're saying so far, well, it's not, it doesn't seem so far-fetched. It doesn't seem so difficult. I think we can do it. We can do with this at home, do it all ourselves and all of that. Would you, uh, um, how, do, how do I put it? Would you advise that any parents have such thoughts or adopt such? Okay. So for the families I've worked with, the parents are my superhero heroes <laughs> because they are doing amazing okay so an occupational therapist is spending like one two three hours with a child yes within the whole 24 hours okay child comes back home spending the next five ten hours with parents definitely you have to train the parents mm -hmm. to be able to engage the children okay and they know their children so well right okay but it, they, they need some level of training to be able to handle the child. And so you don't just pick up some interventions from the internet and just implement them. Mm. If your child is under-stimulated and you don't know how to handle it, you're just going to affect the child's mood. So even as a parent or guardian, you need to get some training yourself. Yes, yes. Okay. And so as part of the first-time consult, after the assessment, You've provided us with all the information we need. We've observed your child. And then we draft a plan with you, the parents. We also teach you. We allow you to sit in the session sometimes 
just so you know how we engage your child. Mm. And so at home, you can be able to go through with it. And then you report to us how it went. And if there are any changes we have to make, we can do that with you. So with this, uh, how, how long could this go on for? So it's, every child is unique. That's why it's a spectrum. And so we can have child A, child B, child C on level one, but they react differently, differently. to things. Okay. okay. And so for me, I tell my parents, I tell my families, we are growing with your child. We can reduce the number of contacts we are having with your child, but okay. that does not mean that we have ended therapy. We are making the child independent, mm -hmm. and that's the goal of occupational therapy. But there's nothing wrong with coming in for an evaluation after some months. And so we are sticking close with the child until we perceive, okay, this child is fine, can do everything, we can discharge you. What would be your definition of fine? That would be our final, my final question. Okay. So fine is when the child is able to perform their daily life activities as On their independent own. as possible. Okay. okay. The child is able to sit in school. Okay. The child is doing their writing. Okay. okay. The child is able to perform, play with their friends. Mm. Okay. We can say that, okay, this child is doing well. Okay. All right. Isaac, thank you so much for your time. Yes. Uh, and viewers, this is where we end the conversation on the role of occupational therapist. Uh, when it comes to a child or children living with autism, what is it exactly that you as a parent or guardian to you can do? So like Isaac rightly said, you need to get some level of education or training as a parent or guardian yourself. Because at the end of the day, you'll be spending more time with your child than your occupational therapist. So you need to train yourself as well. My name is Esi Edouard Komia, and my guest has been Isaac Iwasiao, who is an occupational therapist. I hope you've learned a lot. Coming up next is entertainment. KMJ will be seated with Akasa Bimpong. And he has a very uh, great event coming your way. And it's all about that. So make sure you stick and stay with us. We'll be right back.